well, we're going to address the elephants in the room tonight. And uh, I thought I would take, you know, a couple aspects here. I would take one culturally, even in the world, not of the world. How do we address some of those elephants? And we've spoken about those elephants. So tonight is how do we do it? What's the posture of our heart, how we engage addressing elephants in the room? So we're going to address it culturally. But then also, too, I, I want to address personally. Because sometimes there's some elephants in our room that we know about and that we don't know about that we need to address personally. And and what I mean by that is that we don't need to shout it out and tell everyone, but there are certain elephants that we need to just come down, fall on our knees and just repent. Why? Because it keeps us from God. It keeps us from God's best for our life. And so tonight I want to have a look at some of those things and and also probably uh, give you an illustration of how not to engage some of those things. How not to engage people. And I was going to show an Austin Powers clip, you know, the mole clip, but I was like, no, I better not uh, because, yeah, smart, because I'm a pastor and not a youth pastor anymore. And and so I thought I would just tell you a story Uh, instead, a real life story. And uh, a number of years ago, uh, down at our other location when we were pastors there, we were pastors there for 14 years, and, and I remember one of the guys at the door, and he was an Italian guy. And, and, and you, know, he, you know, he just greeted everyone with a kiss. He was larger than life. And, and there was this one day where this lady comes in the, do- in the doors, and she's coming down, and, he, and he's like, hey, listen, how long have you got to go? When is it due? And she goes, I'm not pregnant. Right there and then, what would you do? You would run. You would be like, I should never have done. But no, he goes one step further. He pulls his card out and goes, you know what? I've joined a great gym. You should come along. You know, there are some things that you just got to go, no, some people should not open their mouth. Some people are not good with people. So, some people just need to go, and the world would be a better place. Do you agree? And, and so I look at this and I go, you know what? We need to learn how to engage people. You know, with people with different opinions or, or people, you know, that have different stance in life, how do we engage them with respect, but also too show them the love of Christ? Show them the love of God. And so this, tonight I, I want to talk and just briefly go over a story in John where we find Jesus is in this place. Where, where the religious leaders have dragged this woman out because she's been caught in adultery and throws her at his feet and, and basically say, you know what, this is what the law of Moses says. Is that a woman found in adultery should be stoned and put to death. You know, right here, Jesus has encountered the elephant of the day. He's encountered the law. He's encountered this, this uh, religious spirit that has come out and said, you know what, you, know what? If you're from, you need to judge her right now. But I love his response. And most of us know the story. Is that his response is, is he gets down on the ground and he just starts writing in the dirt. And as you read through the scripture, and it'll be on the back wall, is that you see that One by one, the accusers start to fall away. And then in the time where the accusers have gone away, he gets up and he's like, where are your accusers? Well, they're not not here. Well, I, I don't accuse you either. But he makes this statement. He says, go and sin no more. I love Jesus because in this moment, In Scripture, he has addressed the elephant in the room. He's addressed culture, but also, too, he's addressed sin. He's addressed the religious leaders of the day that would cry out, we want blood. But he's also come to a time where he stands in the gap and he's like, no. I love 
love this story because it's a story of intolerance and it's a story of tolerance. And Jesus takes no side on either. He says that, you know what, we can't tolerate this. This is a time where, you know what, I know you've done something wrong, but I'm going to leave it up to you to go and sin no more. I love Jesus. His heart was bigger than you and I put together. His heart for people, he bled for people. He respected their dignity. He covered them. And we find in this scripture right here, he covers this woman. He covers her in love and stands in the gap. He stands in the gap. Is that in this moment, he stops and he encounters the crowd, the religious leaders of the day, he encounters them with truth. And then when they've dispersed, he engages the young woman with truth. You know, what I find is that tolerance is the permission to do whatever you want without consequence, responsibility or accountability. And that sounds like the day that we live in today is that you need to be tolerant of me. In other words, you need to let me do whatever I want to do. I'm responsible for it. But then you've got the intolerant ones that are screaming out, you know, we want judgment, we want a sentence, and we want accountability. You know, Jesus was quick to forgive whenever forgiveness was sought. But he was formidably intolerant of unrepentant sinners, of those who refused to change in response to the good news. You know, he would just let them go their way. Let them go their way. Jesus did not practice tolerance or intolerance. He just covered with mercy and truth. He poured out his grace. He poured out his heart. He covered them in love. In the world today, certain people have painted tolerance and intolerance as this virtue that we need to have. Let me tell you today, it's not a virtue. If you read through the scriptures, you'll find that patience and courage is a virtue. You'll find in 1 Corinthians 13, verse 13, and now abide in faith, hope, love, these three, but the greatest is love. But the greatest is love. Faith, hope, and love. They're supernatural virtues. And I believe as individuals, as we're going to go into this world, is that we need to have the supernatural virtues around our life. But at the center of everything that we do, love should be our anchor. Love should be the anchor. It's the greatest. So tonight I want to answer the question, how do we address the elephant in the room? How do we address culture that would oppose the kingdom of heaven? How should we address those in our world? The first thing is, I believe this, is that we should always seek unity. We should always seek unity. It's like, well, what do you mean? Do you have to agree with them? No, you can agree with someone, not agree with someone and still have unity. Colossians 3, 14. And over all these virtues, put on love, which binds them all together in perfect unity. You know, the elephant in the room will say this, you must approve of what I do. Who's heard that? Even though it's going to hurt them, even though it's going to lead them down, you, you must, and when you go to address that, you, you must approve of what I do. But you know what our love response? You know, our response should be in that moment, should be, I will love you even when your behavior offends me. Even if your behavior offends me, offends me, I'm still going to love you no matter what. Christ, he hung on the cross and he loved us no matter what. One act was for the multitudes, but it was really for the individual. He covered the multitudes, but it was for the individual. 
He hung on that cross. He said, no matter what you do, I am here for you, whether you accept it or not. Friend, this is what I love about Jesus, is that He'll love you even though your behavior offends Him. Friend, He chooses you every time. No matter how far you run from Him, He will always choose you. That's what the Scripture says. He just waits for you to choose Him. The invitation is always there. He leaves the power of choice up to you. I was trying to think of the times that I've been offended by everyone in this room. And and I thought, you know, I, I really can't use personal examples here, but I can pick on my kids. And I I do remember a number of years ago, Judah offended me really bad. I was so offended, I was left speechless. Savage. Because in my garage, for the last 12 years, I've had a car sitting, waiting for the day to be done up. And if you've been around me, you'll know this story, but there was a time where Maya comes in to the, to the kitchen and she goes, Hey, Dad, Judah's in your car. Okay. And he's got a hammer, hammer and chisel and he's working out on the dash. I'm like, Judah, son, you offend me. How could you do that? You know, he was three at the time, and I must admit, you know. But I was that offended, I couldn't even talk to him. And I know as soon as I walked in there, he knew just from the look. And Carolina goes to me, well, now I understand why you haven't done it up yet. I'm waiting for the kids to grow up and leave home. And get their own cars. But in that moment, I I believe that in that moment where the woman was on the ground, she knew that her sin would offend God. But in that moment, she would have looked into Jesus' eyes and seen the love that he had for her. You know what? My car, that'll get fixed. But my love for my son goes beyond that. He might have offended me in that moment. But 10 years later, I finally got over it. (laughs) But Jesus in this time is that she would have looked up and known just through looking at his eyes that she would have been covered. She would have had the shame, but she knew the look of her heavenly father. Friend, we need to seek unity in everything that we do. Even though those things may offend us, we still need to show love. This woman that was thrown at the feet of Jesus would have just looked up at him in his eyes and knew. You know, will you love those whose behavior offends you? Is your heart big enough to love those that maybe don't agree with your biblical stance, with your ethos? Are you big enough And you see it time and time again where Jesus was big enough to include those ones in his world in order to reach them. We need to seek unity. Will you love them even if their behavior offends you? The second thing I find when it comes to culture is that we need to take a risk. Proverbs 18.24 says a man who has friends, must himself be friendly. But therefore, but there is a friend who sticks closer than a brother. And what I've found is friends come and go, but there are those ones that stick closer than a brother. I believe in life that we all need friends that stick closer than a brother. You know, these are the type of friends that will be there during the good, the bad, and the ugly. 
you know, the elephant in the room will say this, you, you must allow me to have my way. You're going to have friends that, you know, you'll, you'll, you'll be there, you'll be their friends, but they're like, you know, I, I know what you believe, but you just need to allow me to have my way. Well, okay, have your way. That's okay. But friend, you've still got to love them. You know, love responds in this way. I will plead with you to follow the right way because I believe you are worth the risk. You are worth the risk. Friends, don't write off your friends too quick. They know what you stand for. They know who you are. You don't need to preach at them. You don't need to bash them over the head with a Bible. You just need to live out your life and carry yourself in a way that betrays who God is in your life. And they'll know about it, but then there'll be that pushback and they'll be like, you need to just let me go my way. Well, okay, but I believe you're worth the risk. So I'm still going to keep calling you. I'm still going to keep checking in on you. I'm going to let you do what you want to do, but I love you enough that I'm going to stick there with you through the thick and thin. That's what love does. As Christians, that's what we're called to do. We're called to respond in that way. You know, and I've learned that sometimes that after pleading with people, that after pleading, hey, listen, God has something better for you. You know, right now, it's good, but God has best for you. Hey, right now, you know what God wants to call you out of and into life? And you can plead with them all you want, but at the end of the day, it's their choice. At the end of the day, you've just got to be there for them. But it doesn't mean you stop pleading. It doesn't mean you stop calling them. It doesn't mean that you don't cut them out of your life, but make sure you engage them. Make sure you position yourself in a place so when in the time of need, the relationship is open so they can come back. That's how love responds. That's how we're supposed to respond. You know, you cover them with grace and mercy when they fall out. You cover them. You leave the door open. Jesus always believe that you were worth the risk. He always believed that you were worth the risk. He believed right there in this moment as this woman was dragged out and thrown there on the ground. He, he believed in her that much that he stood in the gap and just started writing in the dirt. What did he write? We don't know. But one by one, the accusers, the culture of the day said, you know we want, we want, started dropping the stones. He covered her. He was there in that time of need. Friends, we need to be ones that believe that they're worth the risk. Believe that they're worth the risk. Have the honest discussion with them because they are worth it. And when I mean an honest discussion, it's not a Facebook rant. It's not a discussion. It's actually inviting them out, sitting across the table, hearing their heart, having a coffee, doing relationship. Doing relationship. Friend, that's what we need to do. The third thing is that it will cost you. You take the risk and it will cost you. It will cost you your time. It will cost you your energy. It will cost you your finance. But they are worth it. They are worth it. In John 15, verse 13, no one has greater love nor stronger commitment than to lay down his own life for his friends. To lay down his own life. Uh, what I've found is a true friend is committed to the friend rather than the friendship. I don't want to disturb the friendship. You know, the friendship is all good. We're, we're on speaking terms. A, a, and you see sometimes in, in their life that, that friend that you're trying to save the friendship with, in turn, 
could ultimately cost that person their life because they're headed down a track that you know is destruction. But a true friend will be the one that goes, you know what, this friendship could be over, but I'm going to sit with them and I'm going to address the elephant in the room. Hey, listen, you know, you've been clubbing a fair bit and you've almost had a few encounters and, and, you know, last time you went out, you didn't even know where you were, you slept on the street and you got home three days later. You know, I, I want to just, as a friend, go, it's not looking good for you. Right there in that moment, that friendship could be over, but, but what you're doing is you're valuing the friend over the friendship. We're called to do that. We're not called to judge, but we're called to be there as a safety net, address the issue, address the, the things that are happening around their life in love, grace, and truth. Love, grace, and and truth you know the elephant says is that you must agree with me love responds I will tell you the truth because I'm convinced that the truth will set you free the truth will set you free and it doesn't mean that you get on a high horse but you do it with love because eventually when you engage them at that level they understand that you truly care And when you truly care, if they get to that point of breaking, they know they can trust you. Why? Because none of their other friends have come to their rescue before the crash, before the fall, before they've hit rock bottom. But they remember the engagement they had with you and they're like, you know what? That's a true friend. I'm going back there to find out what they're doing and how they're living their life because I've screwed up and they're blessed. Church. We should always respond in love. We should always be the ones. At the end of the day, what you walk past, you approve of. And if you've got friends that you know that are in a car, that are heading for a brick wall, and you don't, I'm asking, do you approve of it? Friend, we need to be there for those. We need to be willing to risk it all, but also too, it will cost you. It will cost you. Jesus, he never walked past. He always addressed the issue, but he always left the dignity of choice up to the individual. In this moment, is that he addresses culture But he says to the young lady, you know what, right now, this lifestyle, this thing that you're doing, it actually offends God. It is sin. Go and sin no more. He didn't give her a three-step plan. He just said, I love you. I've stood in the gap right now. But as you go, I don't accuse you. I love you. I cover you with mercy. I cover you with grace. But go and sin And you see it time and time again through Scripture where Jesus is just walking down the road. And he sees an issue and he brings healing, he brings wholeness. He sees another issue, he brings healing and he brings forgiveness. His heart was big enough to include the down and outs. His heart was big enough to look past the offense and love the individual. Friend, that's who we should be as a church. That's who Christians should be. It's not that we become a pushover. No, I'm not saying that. I've never said that once tonight, but we stand in the gap strong on what we believe. But we do it in grace and truth. We do it in love. Many people in this world, you know, they get caught up in the arguments of being tolerant and being intolerant. And, you know, this argument gets louder and louder and you start to wonder if there's actually a difference between being tolerant and intolerant. You know, the devil wants this to happen. You know, the devil has never changed his tricks. He's never changed his tactics. You know, if he can get us distracted, his tricks, 
about being disunity, about being in a place of division, then he's won. But instead, if we engage this world with love, because Jesus, he was never tolerant or intolerant, he just covered with love, just covered culturally. We are called to be in the world and not of the world. You know, tolerance glorifies division. Love seeks unity. Tolerance seeks to be inoffensive, but, but love takes risks. Tolerance costs nothing, but love costs everything. Friend, I would do anything for my young ones. I would engage them if they're on the wrong path. Why? Because I care for them. Why? Because I love them beyond whatever you could imagine. And that's what we're called to do. God loves you no matter what. He loves us that much that He sent His Son. And so culturally we're called to stand in love. Culturally we're called to engage the world. Culturally, we're called to get involved and see heaven come to earth, share the love of Christ. And friend, most people, first thing they're going to see of Christ is you. Is why? Because they're going to see Christ in you first. And so culturally, that's how we're supposed to engage. But then personally, how are we supposed to engage? You know, like this woman. She was there. And Jesus is like, where are your accusers? And well, they're not here. They've gone. Well, he's like, well, I don't accuse you. Go and sin no more. Friend, personally, our engagement should be this. Repentance. You know, tonight, there could be something in your world right now that keeps you from God. And friend, that thing is called sin. And sin is that thing that distances us from God. And so you might be distanced from God right now, but, but the way we deal with that is called Repentance. It is accepting what Jesus did on a cross where he gave his life for you and I. And he said, listen, it's not nails that are holding me to this cross. It's love for humanity. It's a, a vision of you connecting with the heavenly father. Why? Because the father chooses you. And through scripture, it says that, that he chooses us. He gives an invitation to us. And then it's our job to respond. With this girl here, she's going to sin no more. And then that's the end. That's all he says. Friend, if we want to deal personally with issues and the elephants in our room, first of all, we need to acknowledge that there's an elephant. And, and this is what I find is that God forgives us but the issue is and we accept that God will forgive us but the issue is is we don't forgive ourselves and, and what we've got to realize is when we're addressing sin or the elephant in the room and, and for some it could be little white lies. For others, it could be pornography. For others, it could be a number of things. And we've covered a number of things in Elephant in the Room over the last month. But personally, it's something that is standing in between. It could be something that you keep on doing over and over and over again. Why? Because you know that God has forgiven you, but you haven't forgiven yourself. And so repentance is this. is it, It's coming to God. And as He says, hey... I love you enough. I don't accuse you right now. I cover you with grace and mercy. But go and sin no more. And what takes place there is we go, you know what? We believe in Jesus. We believe in His love. We believe that He is Lord and Savior. We believe that He sent His Son to die on the cross. 
And we accept that right now. But friend, the other part is, is that we need to repent and say, God, right now, this thing that has offended you, this thing that is keeping me out of your presence and out of relationship with you right now, I want to lay it at your feet. And God, I know that you forgive me, but God, right now, can you help me forgive myself? Help me address the elephant in the room of my heart. Help me address that thing that is keeping me from you where you should rightfully sit. And friend, that only comes when we truly find our identity in Christ because we know we can't do it on our own. We can't do it on our own. The way to deal with sin is to repent. And God asks us for forgiveness. Or God gives us forgiveness. And then we move on. Do you notice he didn't say anything else about the sin? He didn't address the woman in any other way. He just said, go and sin no more. Friend, that's how we need to be. Jesus says, hey, listen, I love you enough. I'm going to deal with those personal elephants in your room, but you just need to hand them over. I see them, and all I'm saying is I choose you. Go and sin no more. And then it comes back to us. He gives us the dignity. I found this, that God isn't looking for perfection. He's actually just looking for progression. He's not looking for perfection. You will never be perfect enough never be righteous enough, but in Him, you will be. In Him, He covers you. In Him, He brings you into right standing with Him. But it's whether we're willing to lay our life and those things out to Him. Friend, tonight, culturally, when addressing elephants around your life and in your world, can you do it with love? Can you bring unity? Can you take the risk on your friends? And it will cost you. But tonight I want to ask personally, how is your walk with God? How is your walk with God in addressing elephants in your room? And it could be pride. It could be a number of things. But it's just coming back to saying, God, here it is. I know that you forgive me, but God, help me forgive myself. Help me truly hand it over to you so that I can walk in freedom. And Jesus talks about it in Matthew. He talks about his yoke. He talks about all who come, who are weary, who are burdened, who are weighed down. Come to me and take hold of my yoke. And in other words, take hold of me and let me and come with me and your burden will be light. Friend tonight, he wants to carry us. We need to be yoked to him. We need to come to him.